Well, praise the Lord and welcome to this week's edition of our weekly broadcast with our pastor and founder, William Whitfield. Let us prepare our hearts to go into the praise world the Lord, of the Lord. This is Pastor Whitfield coming to you on this Sunday, January 17th, 2014, welcoming you to our weekly broadcast. As you could tell today, we're not in our usual studio, but we're on the road today. And we want to give the word of the Lord to you because it is such in our spirit on today. The Lord has been dealing with me on this particular passage of scripture that we're going to talk about uh, for the last couple of days. So again, I want to just give you the word of the Lord. We have taken time to go away and seek the, seek the face of the Lord and to stay before the Lord to find out what God is asking of us. And during the course of that time alone with the Lord, the Lord began to speak this particular scripture into my spirit, man. And I want to share with you because it's still standing out what the Lord wants for each and every one of our lives throughout the course of our lives, not just because a new year has changed and a calendar has changed, but because the Lord wants this out of each and every one of our lives. So let us pray and we'll go right into the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for this your day, we thank you for your many manifold blessings. We thank you, God, because you are Lord and you are the omnipotent one over us all. We pray, God, as you bless us in your word, that we will be a blessing unto countless numbers of people. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, we pray. Amen and amen. Let Jesus Christ bless you to be able to walk in the power of his endless life and discover the endless possibilities of knowing him. We're going to begin our reading of Hebrews, the seventh chapter and the 16th verse, and only one verse we'll be looking at uh, here in the book of Hebrews. And it reads as follows, who is made not after the law of the carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. And when I read this scripture the other day, actually, I was listening to the Bible that was recorded. And this particular verse stood out to the point that I had to go back and research it. Sometimes so those of us that are preachers and those of us that walk with the Lord, that study the word of the Lord, you know that sometimes when you read something, something leaps off of the pages and into your spirit or whether someone is speaking the word of the Lord that is profound to you in that moment will leap off the pages and leap into your spirit, regardless of how often you may have read it. It did not hold the impact that it had when you read it and when it became life unto your spirit, when it leaped off of the pages of the word of the Lord. And such was the case with this particular passage of scripture today. And more so, the latter part of that verse was the part that really stood out for me. But after the power of an endless life, and this is talking about Jesus in the Hebrews, the seventh chapter, about his priesthood and his lineage, that his lineage was not based upon that which Moses prescribed, which the priesthood should come from. All of us that study the scripture know that the Levitical order was those who were appointed by Moses to tend to the tabernacle, the things of the tabernacle, to set up the tabernacle, to break down the tabernacle. And there were certain groupings of the Levitical priesthood that only could touch such certain items within the tabernacle. And if any other portion of that tribe of the, Levi of the Levitical priesthood touch any of the instruments of the Lord that they were not supposed to, then the Lord himself would break out against them. So it was very clear that the Levitical priesthood had to make sure that they were honoring the Lord. And in order to serve as a Levitical priest in the tabernacle, they had to prove their lineage back to Abraham. They had to prove their lineage back to Abraham. That's why you see the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the book of Matthews as well as the book of Luke. But according to the scripture, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, from which the scripture mentions nothing, absolutely nothing about the priesthood being relegated unto them. But it always talks about the Levitical order. Jesus did not come from 
according to the natural birth or from the tribe of, the, of, the, of Levi. But he came from the tribe of Judah. And also the Bible here in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, makes a parallel, parallel between Melchizedek, a priest without beginning or end. And Jesus Christ, the same way, without beginning or end. Now, some of you may argue, we know Jesus' origin because he was born of the Virgin Mary. Then you would be in error because the Bible says that from the beginning, the word of the Lord, who is Jesus Christ, in John, the first chapter, talks about that the world was made through him and without him was nothing made. He was in the beginning with the Father. So, but the word became flesh through the virgin birth, through Mary, and became a living being. He took on the very nature of sinful man and was born as through the virgin Mary, and there was his portal into the earth to come like sinful man so that he would be able to identify with all the points that man has gone through and would be considered to be a faithful high priest. So after the order of Melchizedek, without beginning or end, Jesus Christ became the high priest of an endless order because he is the sole high priest. And that's like every other high priest came, lived their lives, and died. Death took over them. But Jesus Christ who came to the earth through the virgin birth, died on Calvary's cross, but get this, he defeated death and gained the power of an endless life, which is what he wants for all of us. So let us get into the scripture. It says, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, which we just talked about, proving his lineage back to the Levitical priesthood. He didn't have to do that because he came from the tribe of Judah, the strong tribe, the warring tribe, the praising tribe, the victorious tribe, the tribe that was relegated or given the order of a lion. They were strong. They were fierce. But it says after the power of an endless life, power here means dunamis, dunamis, a dy dynamis is how it's really pronounced. This is force, and this is talking about a miraculous power, a miracle to sustain life perpetually. Jesus Christ's power and his ability to defeat death perpetually, destroying this power through the force and the strength and the sovereignty of his life defeated the powers of death and gained an advantage and an ability over the sinful nature, the power of death that all of us lived under because of the fall of Adam and Eve, but God extended unto us life and life eternal. He gave us the miraculous power to be able to stand and to live when we accept the powers that is in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, and you hear me say it quite frequently, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. John 1, John 3 and 16, which many of us know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that word perish means ultimately completely destroyed. That they shall not perish, but have everlasting life life. They will have the miracle of living forever. And the thing is, listen to me clearly, we all will live forever. Make no bones about it, but how will you live forever? There are two dynamic states in which we will live forever. One will be in the eternal presence of God Almighty in the depths of Jesus Christ's love in, in eternity. Free from sin, free from suffering, free from strife, free from bitterness, free from anger, free from disease, free from torment, free from persecution, free from lies, free from the devil's influence, free from the lack of quality of life to live an immense bless eternal life in the presence of the almighty God. One. Number two is to live apart 
from God in the lake of fire, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, where you will be tormented day and night for the lack of repentance from sin. That is not God's desire for humanity or for mankind. God's desire is that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, the operative word here, two words, to be saved, a phrase, and come to the knowledge of the truth. The word come, that all men should be saved, should means there's a choice that needs to be made on the part of the individual. Come means that they must make momentum. They must traverse. They must have it in their minds to come to or travel towards or pursue the will and the mind of God. There, is, there are choices contained within the word of the Lord. It's not automatic because you live a good life. It's not automatic because you do good deeds. It's not automatic because you live a morally good life. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior so that he can fill you with all the goodness of the power to live an endless life. Now, he himself, because he lives an endless life, because he defeated the powers of death and hell, rose from the grave on the third day with all power in his might, he has the power of an endless life. And unlike the priesthood that was there before him, he now is a faithful high priest. He is walking in the priesthood, the high priesthood forever, which means that now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints and all of those who will come to eternal life. Jesus Christ is given to each and every man the power to walk free from the powers of sin and death if you would trust and believe in his name, you can walk free from the powers of sin, death, hell, and the grave. Let me repeat. If you would believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord of glory, you would have the power to walk free from sin, death, hell, and the grave. And he, by you trusting in the power in his name, you will walk in the power of Jesus Christ in an endless life. God wants us to know that the endless life talks about his ability to save, but it also grants unto you the abundance of a heavenly nature. Now let's talk about the abundance of a heavenly nature. It means that you have the abundance of full access to God himself throughout the course of your life, that you could come boldly to the throne, that you could come as his child, never once being pushed away, never once being met with anger or bitterness. But as a child loves his parents, his father, looking to him for protection, looking to him for strength, looking for, to him for dignity and honor and acceptance and to embrace, knowing that in the dignity of the Father, that the Son has everything that the Father wants them to be a part of, the abundance of his presence, showing that he is mighty, that he is mighty, he is powerful, and that he has an ability that he pursues. Listen, he pursues your soul salvation with such a mighty strength to enact violence on everything that would hold you back from his eternal abode. Listen, he ferociously goes after the very powers and has, past tense, gone after the powers of hell and has defeated them very 
aggressively. And now to pursue you and to prove to you that he loves you, he still pursues everything that comes up against you violently to make sure that your soul is secured in him, secured in him, and protected in him. Tune in bi-weekly on social media to hear the word of the Lord through Pastor Woodfield. Join us and be empowered by the word of the Lord unto you. That's why the scripture says in Romans 8, 38 to 39, and let me read it. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, once again. For I am persuaded, in other words, the, the writer here says that he is fully convinced, the Apostle Paul talks about, he is fully persuaded. He is fully confirmed in his spirit. And he is relaxed in the understanding and the full knowledge and the full belief, not frivolous belief, but firm belief that stabilizes and anchors his soul, that nothing, that neither death, listen, that's the very first thing, that neither death, the ability or not the ability, the power that once ruled over us was death. And when we were dead, that is it. But in this life, based upon our current actions to repent, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we can defeat through the name of Jesus Christ the powers of death that we can say, as the Apostle Paul says, for I am persuaded that neither death, that death cannot keep me back from the very life or the powers of an endless life to live in eternity, although this natural flesh will go back to the ground. But my spirit man belongs to God. My soul belongs to God. And my soul will live for eternity in heaven, in the power of an endless life being transformed into the very image and nature of God. The Bible goes on to say that death has no power over us. Death, where is thy victory? Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Death, where is thy sting? You don't have to worry about death. Your only concern as a born-again Christian is to be concerned and listen. You don't even have to be concerned because when God grants you eternal life and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you don't have to concern yourself or occupy yourself where you're going to spend eternity ever again because once your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, your eternal estate has been firmly and completely established in God. Listen, the Bible goes on to say that I am fully persuaded that neither death nor angels, angelic beings, listen, they are not trying to keep you from the will of God. As a matter of fact, they ask God a question. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou should visit him? They ask God the question. But because they're in tune and in sync with God, they understand God's intense love towards his creation. And they understand that as ministering spirits, they first and foremost cater to God. And God commands them to cater to men the way that he sees fit and necessary and to look out for mankind. But it goes on to say, neither principalities, 
the spirits of the darkness of this world, nor powers, nor things present, nothing in this world would ever be able to pull you away from God's love, nor things to come, not in future events and things that will come, people that will come into your life, even demonic forces that will attempt to come into your life. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, nor height, nor death, death, nor any creature shall be able to separate us. Nothing will cause us to be able to flee from God. The only thing that can cause you a person, that can cause you or power, that can cause you to be separated from God is if you make up in your mind to backslide and to leave God. But listen to this. The Bible said that he is even married to the backslider, that he will come after you. And it takes a very hard heart to not even recognize that God himself is pursuing you in a relationship and that you belong to him. It takes a really hard-hearted person who has been blinded to the truth to walk after a lie, after having been enlightened with the holy gift of heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is our ministry's hope that the endless blessings of the Lord, of his endless life, pursue you all the days of your life and bless you to come into the boundlessness of his grace, mercy, love, the grains favor, of sand. peace, and joy, the stars of happiness, the sky. contentment, so shall and the power of his be. resurrection forever. So when you talk about power, you cannot help but talk about the virtue of Jesus' life. He lived a life that was in sync with God. And he lived a life that was not morally depraved, but morally acceptable and honorable in God's eyesight. As a matter of fact, the way that he lived his life was an excellent example. We have no other examples of excellence outside of Jesus Christ. And even when we look at all the biblical characters that walk with God, the Bible points out some of their flaws. The only person in Scripture that the Bible does not point flaws out in is Jesus Christ. Then it talks about John the Baptist and Enoch. But the only perfect one is Jesus Christ. Notice when the apostle John in the book of Revelation talks about the search for one to open up the seals of the book. And John began to weep. And the angel said to him, Weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and he has been found worthy to open up the seals. Or the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, he was found worthy to open the seals. Why? Because of the very nature of his virtue. Virtue. He was not morally depraved, but yet he was morally fulfilled and fulfilling that he walked in an excellence and his power and a strength that none of us can understand. He walked in goodness and in righteousness and conducted himself according to high ethical principles. He walked according to the plan in the mind of God. Often I think about the prayer life of Jesus with his father. When he withdrew himself to a solitude place to seek the father, just imagine the communication that occurred between he and his father. And one of the things that God revealed to me was this. 
It was him and his son talking to himself. You cannot help but walk in the perfection of prayerfulness and in the will of God when you are that dynamically one in sync with the Father. The God of glory connected to the Son of Man. Let me give you an example from our today's technology. It's like you're taking your cell phone, hooking it through to your computer, through a USB cord that not only downloads information from the main computer to your cell phone through that wire, but it brings about a connectivity through the same or similar technologies that they could communicate with one another with a link that is unbroken. Now, unlike the Father and the Son, there is never a con disconnection when Jesus separates himself out of prayer. When he comes out of prayer, there is never a separation, but they remain feathered. Unlike the cell phone and your computer, where you must separate the two to adequately use both or at least use the cell phone apart or your tablet apart from the master computer. But yet Jesus never breaks connectivity with his Father. Again, thus proving the power of an endless supply of life, eternal and immortal, where he's walking so connected to the Father that he sees and hears and does things that no other human being could ever have done without God himself, his presence, being with him. The power of an endless life means for us that are Christians that we have been crucified with Christ we have been buried with him through water baptism. We have died first to our flesh and to ourselves and accepted him. We have died and been buried in a water grave through, through baptism. Then we arise to walk in the newness of life to come to understand him and have our minds transformed to come to know him and to understand him. And then to be baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost that purges us from a sinful life and works on us for the eradication of the sinful nature continuously. The eradication of the sinful nature as we walk with God to be made perfect Understand that this is a progressive walk with the Lord to be made perfect. And when we come into the place of perfection with God, as we walk with God, we begin to enter into the power of an endless life. Now, understand that the power of an endless life does just not stop with one being converted and conformed into the image of God, but the power of an endless life means that now I'm tapping into the power reserve and the power resource of the life of Jesus Christ so that now I can walk according to the power of Jesus Christ's life. And now I can walk in the powers of the resurrected powers of God. The Bible said, oh, that I might know him in the power and the fellowship of his sufferings. That I might know him to walk in the powers of God.
The Bible talks about, oh, that I might know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. In order for us to come to the powers of an endless life, we must understand the benefits of suffering. Suffering works in us patience and perseverance. Suffering causes us to identify with Jesus Christ. And once we have suffered, we come to a spiritual death where it's no longer I, but it's the Christ that lives in me. This is where you come into the fellowship of his suffering and of his resurrection. When you have come to the power that that suffering has caused a death in you, you now come to the power by the will of God, to the power of the resurrection, where God begins to teach you the power to walk in the power of an endless life. When you come to an endless life, you understand that endless is indissolvable and is permanent. In other words, there is something in you about the old nature that has now been completely destroyed and demolished, that now the legalities of sin And Lucifer has no longer any more options or control over you. The finality of your former nature has now been completely dissolved. And in this comes the incapability of being, or the incapability of being dissolved, or the capabilities of being dissolved. And now the decomposition of a former life has been realized. Now your image in God has been transformed. And transformation brings along with it the full effects and the ability to walk in the dunamis power, the strength, the might and the will of God to the point that your life has now been exchanged for the life of God and your life is now hidden in God and now your life has become a spiritual offering holy and acceptable unto God and now You're walking in your reasonable service and dedication to the power of an endless life. And endless means that now you're walking in the power that is open up to you without reserve, without reservation, without God holding anything Back from you. You have now become a friend of God. This is the place where he calls you friend. Friend because you understand the power source that is at your disposal. And you understand that that power source has been given to you because you come into a relationship and an understanding with God. That no longer will you dishonor him. He's calling you friend. Because you understand that you will bring nothing in. To cause a diminishing. And the power flow. Or the power resource. You come to understand that the purity of your priesthood has to be honorable and acceptable to God at all times. And that this power source in God is the very thing and the very